Hello, so I'm Dan Warrender. I'm a mental health nurse. I'm an MBT practitioner and also a lecturer in mental health nursing. Um, what I've got here is a, a conference presentation that I did recently that I was going to record just to make a bit more accessible to people that might be interested in the ideas. So whether that's uh, students or just anyone that's kind of interested in this subject matter. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is the action, the action consequences model. So it's a model I developed for a paper I wrote in 2017, came out 2017-2018, uh, for guiding discussion on risk management for people diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder. Um, so what I've got here is a presentation of some of my ideas. I'll introduce the model, uh, which I've updated since uh, the original paper. And essentially the idea is that it'll help us think about uh, some important things uh, in the, the complex kind of decision-making process that's involved uh, with risk management. Um, I guess an important thing about language for a start, it's always worth emphasizing why we're using people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and why the diagnosis is in inverted commas there. Um, we know that people with the diagnosis have had often really difficult histories, difficult attachment histories, experienced uh, significant trauma. Um, and as a result, the uh, disorder uh, is, is hotly kind of contested. You could certainly argue that people's behavior is very ordered uh, and adaptive based on the things that they have experienced. Um, and I think it makes a big difference to how you work with people. If you see that people are diagnosed with a borderline personality disorder, but they are not disordered people. I think that's incredibly important. So I'm going to kind of ramble through this. I'm going to think out loud. Um, and I'm sure uh, this will be probably different than when I did it <laughs> at a conference last week. But I hope you get something from it. So why is it important for a start? Why, why do we need a model for, for thinking about this? So we know people with a diagnosis have the current thoughts and actions related to uh, harming themselves. Uh, and some people present frequently to uh, mental health services in crisis. And I think that's that's why the model is particularly important. It's about that the current kind of um, crisis care. It's about those ongoing suicidal thoughts uh, and that ongoing risk management, particularly when people present to services uh, quite frequently. I think it becomes uh, very complex in, in those cases. When assessing and managing risk, uh, decisions are often either to contain or tolerate risk. So when we're thinking about the distinction between those two things, containment in its extreme is doing something that prevents the person from potentially kind of hurting themselves. So uh, a containing measure could be uh, a hospital admission. It could be um, use of kind of constant observations or continuous interventions. It could be ultimately the, the use of the Mental Health Act, um, and it could even go as far as uh, physical restraint and things like that. So these are containing measures, things that we're doing to stop uh, people from, from doing things that, that may, they might hurt themselves. The tolerating risk, um, if you take it to the extreme end of tolerating risk, it's essentially knowing that people um, might have had suicidal thoughts or significant self-harm and ultimately might kind of let them go home and like be without sort of follow-up or intervention. That's a very extreme end of tolerating risk. So there's normally a choice between these two things. And there's obviously a spectrum and lots of things we can do. We can be extremely containing, we can be extremely tolerating, but normally we're floating in the middle. And I think it's floating in the middle that we need to do. And as a result, we need to really, really think about it. Interventions can help and can harm. Now, I think that's really important that despite, um, despite any kind of intentions, um, healthcare can have a negative impact on people. Um, and the model will help us think about that as well. Healthcare should be driven by the ethical principles, principles of beneficence, which is do good, and non-maleficence, do no harm. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, decision-making around risk can be really anxiety-provoking, um, and we can stop mentalizing in, in those instances. 
Um, I certainly remember having to make kind of decisions regarding uh, risk uh, when people were kind of telling me that they wanted to kill themselves um, and really having to make that decision of uh, can I let this person leave just now? You know what I mean? It's, it's a really, it's a horrible anxiety to carry. And I think in these instances where we've got a high level of stress, it's sometimes uh, difficult to really, really think about the nuance of our decisions. Uh, and we can become quite fixed in binary and, and miss all the gray area in there. And that's, that's a human thing. I think it's just about us acknowledging that and trying to, trying to think as much as we can. Uh, importantly here, the model is not a how-to. Um, this is it's not something to look at and say, all right, okay, it says that you do this in this instance. That's not what this model is for whatsoever. It's really important things to think about because I'm saying that it's sometimes difficult to think. We sometimes stop thinking. So this might help us kind of get back there. And I think, I mean, just a, a note about models. I think any model um, loses its um, kind of, its ability to be person-centered uh, when we're incredibly rigid with it. You know what I mean? I think models are useful guides, you know what I mean? Uh, that can help us uh, deliver the best care we can to people. But if we become too fixed, then we become model-centered rather than person-centered. You know, what I mean? we become fixed on our own agenda of what we're gonna do rather than what might be uh, best for this individual. So that's why this is important, essentially, trying to think about doing the best for people and ultimately doing no harm. Now, the just right intervention, the Goldilocks intervention that I've written down there, I think that is aiming for the person-centered intervention, the intervention that's really, really person-centered. But what, what you see, um, what you hear from people's experiences, certainly all over social media, and it's kind of all over the research literature as well, is approaches to people with a diagnosis that can range between these two really sharp uh, extremes. So what I'm describing as too cold is exclusion from services. So essentially we don't admit them, it's their responsibility so regardless of kind of uh, suicidality or self-harming, there's always this sense of like, it's their responsibility, we're not going to do anything. But then you also see instances of the too hot, which uh, is risk aversion, you know what I mean? So it's our responsibility, you can't keep yourself safe uh, in defensive psychiatry. And it's, it's interesting that you do see a paradox between these two approaches in people that are either never admitted but then also sometimes people that are admitted and uh, never let go. You know, I mean, people can spend uh, years in, in the hospital sometimes. Um, and I know this is a, it's an incredibly complex uh, thing, but again, it's something that we need to think about. So to be person-centered and to get it just right, this requires careful thought. And again, this is me trying to sell the model a little bit in terms of, I think if you have a think about these things, it will certainly do no harm um, in terms of, uh, well, it won't make things uh, kind of any worse thinking about it. I think it's when we don't think about things that uh, we can end up with, uh, with problems. So here is the model. Um, and I apologize that it doesn't look very pretty, but what I'm gonna do is I'll talk you through essentially what might happen in an instance of somebody presenting to services um, experiencing thoughts or intent of suicide or significant self-harm, then think about what might happen if we contain risk or we tolerate risk. And again, it's not a how-to, this is just things to think about. These are not things that definitely will happen. These are things that might happen. So you can see the actions uh, down the side are what we do, either contain risk or tolerate risk. And the potential consequences along the top are the things to think about, the things that might happen. So if we start off with uh, containing risk, the first thing um, is the benefit, which is obviously uh, patient safety. Yeah, that's why it would be a sensible thing uh, at times is if somebody is uh, experiencing thoughts of suicide or something like that, then we intervene and we protect patient safety. 
while that is a good thing to do, there are dangers that come with that as well. We need to think about the potential of re-traumatization. We know that people with a diagnosis, many people have experienced uh, significant trauma in the past. And despite best intentions, I think the, the measures that mental health services can use to contain risk, like I was saying, um, could be kind of admission to hospital, um, constant observations, uh, the Mental Health Act, and even use of kind of physical restraint at times. What these all have in common is uh, they've got an incredible experience of having power over you. Uh, but then if you think about uh, particular experiences potentially of being restrained, etc., that could be really, really um, triggering and um, terribly re-traumatizing for people that might have been through uh, some horrible things in the past. Um, the second thing is that there might be an element of disempowerment. Um, now, when you come into an environment when you are contained, you might not be able to do the things that you would normally do to kind of to try and cope yourself. Uh, self harm might be one of those instances. I mean, I think that there's a common approach to self harm. I think within some mental health services that seems to be to really view it as a problem when for many people, it can actually be their solution. And I know that's an incredibly difficult thing to just sort of let people self harm. And I'm not saying that we should do that. I think that needs extremely careful thought. But what we do have to think is if somebody comes in a containing environment and then they're not allowed to use coping mechanisms that they would have otherwise used, then what happens to them? You know, I mean, if we're not going to provide realistic alternatives that people buy into, then that's going to be really, really kind of disempowering for people. So people are not going to have the same freedom to do things that they might have found uh, helpful in the past. There's also some arguments that it might kind of reinforce people's beliefs that they can't keep themselves safe as well. So by um, kind of uh, presenting to services and having services intervene, does that kind of uh, take away uh, some of uh, the, the person's personal responsibility in those instances? Um, and then I guess an interesting thing about mental health services is that um, we can be quite good at taking away people's personal responsibility while simultaneously telling them that they need to take responsibility for themselves. So just stuff to think about. In the short term of containing risk, there might be patient safety, but there's clinician comfort as well. And I think that's what we need to be really mindful of is um, as professionals, we're human beings. So how much of our decisions are influenced by what makes us feel safer, what makes us feel better, uh, particularly if we're really worried about kind of uh, high, uh, high risk of, uh, of harm. Now in the long term, I think this is where containing risk becomes really, really complicated and uh, messy, I think, at times. I don't think there's a better word than that. Now, there is a potential that it might create dependence. Um, I'll make the distinction between containing and treatment uh, in, in a little while, but and it's worth mentioning here as well, because just because somebody is contained in an environment, they're maybe not able to kind of uh, hurt themselves for a, a degree of time. That's not synonymous with kind of helping them with that underlying distress. So if people are contained in an environment, um, then this might essentially kind of create a, a, a dependence and you know, I mean a sense of being institutionalized uh, in a in a kind of in a place. And I think particularly with people that have maybe really long admissions to hospital. You could argue that that person is alive and they might be safe. And I think what we do have to argue is, does safety feel safe for that person? But what can happen is, I just had a brain fart in my head and um, I'm just gonna let you see it <laughs> in the moment as a human being. This is me having a brain fart. Yeah, okay, it's back. So what can happen is that the person's alive, but you could argue that they experience a social death uh, in that they might lose connections that they had uh, outside. You know, I mean, if people are in a hospital for years, 
they potentially lose any uh, employment they might have had, they might lose their, their social networks, etc. So it becomes very, very difficult to leave that environment if it becomes, if you're in hospital for a long time, that almost becomes your kind of potentially your, your family unit, you know what I mean? It becomes very, very complicated um, in terms of your attachment relationships. Malignant alienation. Um, now there's stuff written about this uh, concept, which is essentially when a person feels so kind of ostracized within a contained environment that they start to feel worse. Um, and we could think about instances where the environment actually contributes to the distress that a person's feeling. So we're containing risk because we're worried about what might happen to this person. But meanwhile, the distress is being fueled by the experience of being in a situation that uh, the person finds incredibly difficult. And we know there's a lot of stigma around the diagnosis. And I've certainly seen people with a diagnosis that feel hated by uh, staff teams around them. Um, and you have to just imagine what, what is that experience like if you're in an environment and you think that uh, people around you uh, don't want you to be there. Uh, it must be absolutely horrible. And so we have to think about what does that do? It pushes people away. Um, there's a breakdown in that kind of social connection. You feel disconnected, you feel unworthy, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's going to do nothing uh, to uh, helping people recover. Um, evolution of risk. Um, I think when you think about risk, I don't think it's something you can ever eliminate. Um, and if you think about risk, think about like trying to hold like jelly in your hands or something like that. You squeeze it tight enough, it'll squeeze between your fingers. So I think the more we kind of try and contain things, then things will slip out. And I think what you can see is an evolution of risk where people might have the means of harming themselves in some ways taken away. But unless we do anything about that underlying distress, uh, then that risk will come out in, in other ways. You know, I mean, people might find other ways of, of hurting themselves. Now, the interpretation of the motive, I think that is really, really important. And I think that's sometimes uh, almost overlooked in terms of decision making. But I think we are social animals and we're fragile to what other people think of us. Now, I think the thing about containing risk is that particularly to the lay person or the media that, that never have a a real understanding of everything that's kind of going on in individual cases. Containing risk with somebody that has experienced kind of suicidal thinking will always look good. It will always look from the outside, you know what I mean, without getting the detail of it, it will always look caring and compassionate. We've seen hopefully from kind of going along those potential dangers that there are some real kind of issues with that. But I think it's easy to justify in terms of um, a decision why you're containing this risk because we're keeping them alive because we care. And I'm not doubting that, that people uh, do care, but we're not necessarily thinking about the, the non-maleficent stuff along the way. We're not thinking about the stuff that actually, actually harms. And we need to think about the amount of people that are looking in on our decisions that might influence how we make those decisions. We've got the the patient, we've got the uh, patient's family, um, we've got our colleagues, we've got um, the media, the organisation, um, all these things. So how is the, the motive interpreted? Now we'll move down to tolerating risk, okay? So imagine somebody presenting suicidal, etc., and we're going to try and not contain it, we're going to try and tolerate the risk. So the first benefit of tolerating the risk is that the person has autonomy, you know what I mean? So they have freedom, there's no restriction on what they can and can't do. So that's, that's certainly a good thing if that can happen. The danger of tolerating risk, again, might be that there's an element of re-traumatization, particularly with uh, an experience of invalidation. Remembering that a lot of people might have experienced uh, difficulties in attachment relationships. People might have felt unseen. They might have felt invisible. And then they go to health services and say, I'm suicidal. 
and sometimes there's not a kind of um, not necessarily a, a response that that kind of contains in any way. So people might feel um, invalidated by that. They might feel that services don't care. Um, and I'll emphasize this later as well, but I think that's why it's just so important that we really communicate effectively the reasons for our decision making and the empathy underpins everything. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to that as well. So just, just bearing in mind that people might really have this experience. This might really be kind of triggering for people. So they're, they're experiencing suicidal thoughts and they're, they're telling people and there might be that sense of you're not suicidal enough um, or there's nothing we can do or we don't think you should come into hospital. And, and that might be a reasonable decision, but again, really important that uh, that's commun communicated effectively. Um, clinician complacency. So one of the real dangers in tolerating risk is that there is a sense of complacency and then ultimately that people might die. Um, something that's really important to think about is the danger of assuming that because people have had potentially attempted suicide in the past, and not died, that they will continue to attempt suicide and not die, right? Uh, so that's, you think about the science of induction, you know what I mean? So that's taking, essentially, looking at past experiences and predicting future experiences kind of based on that. Uh, I'm just remembering something I got taught in philosophy years ago, you know what I mean? The example of the, the chicken, you know what I mean? So the chicken, um, it's a little scientist and it is kind of, it's uh, assessing its world and he notices a farmer comes every day, chucks down some seed, uh, eats the seed, farmer goes away. Um, and this happens for maybe like a hundred days or something like that. This kind of, this keeps repeating. Um, then obviously one day the farmer comes and uh, kills the chicken. And uh, you know what I mean? So that's a falsifier. So despite the evidence being that, oh, this might continue to happen in this way, it only takes one falsifier uh, for that theory to, to kind of fall apart. And I think that's the thing that we need to bear in mind. Uh, and never, never get complacent, never, never not believe people that when they're saying that they genuinely tried to kill themselves. Um, because if we do get complacent, then all it takes is that one falsifier um, and people can die. So we need to. We need to bear that in mind. Now, in the short term of tolerating risk, the risk is short term, and then there might be a lot of kind of clinician anxiety there. Like I said, it's really anxiety provoking. I think you can feel like someone's life is in your hands. That can be really scary. And how much of that is influencing your decisions? Now, in the long term of tolerating risk, I guess the more we tolerate risk rather than containing risk, there is more opportunity for a person to develop their own coping mechanisms. Now, what I'm careful to add here is that I don't think it's fair to just tolerate risk and expect that people will develop their own coping mechanisms. It's much easier to tolerate risk if we are providing some other meaningful input that might not be containing, but it might be kind of helping people essentially develop skills or kind of access to therapies or whatever that allows people to do that. And then we may, maybe don't uh, need to contain in those instances. So the more we tolerate for a longer term, uh, people might have that opportunity to develop their own coping mechanisms, but we shouldn't just expect that that's going to happen without uh, some meaningful input. And again, so if Containing risk can often look good. It can often look like it's very caring and compassionate. Tolerating risk can look as if it's kind of neglect. Um, so um, we need to bear in mind how these decisions are being interpreted by, uh, by everyone that's, that's kind of relevant uh, here. So that in short is, um, is the model. And like I'm saying, it's just things to think about. I'm not trying to oversell this as the law or, and I'll be really honest, you know what I mean? This is like, so it's, I've added new thinking that I've had over the last while since I published the paper. 
And the more I learn and the more I think about stuff, I will change my mind. So, you know, I mean, if anyone watches this and, and thinks this is absolute crap and I've, or I'm overlooked something uh, really, really important, then please let me know. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm keen to kind of move my thinking forward as well. But I think for the meantime, you know, I mean, these are things that are maybe not thought about as much as they could be. So. Some important caveats. Containing risk isn't synonymous with treatment and safety isn't synonymous with wellness. So we can't just contain risk and think that people are going to feel better. You know, I mean, we need to do something therapeutic, something meaningful. Um, I recall an instance of um, a patient in a ward turning to me after they'd been there for maybe about a week and saying, um, when does the therapy start? Um, and that was a bit of a, a crushing kind of realization of, you know, I mean, like what, what we're offering is, is not, it's, it's not as much as I would, I would like to be able to offer. And I think, again, that's, that's sometimes complex in terms of resources available, but just containment isn't going to help people uh, feel better. There's no recovery without an element of risk. Um, and like I'm saying, I don't think you can completely eliminate risk, but we can't tolerate risk and expect people to recover. I think I've, I've made that point. We have to provide some kind of useful input. Decisions might not always be based on doing the right thing, but might be based on looking good, yeah, or uh, fitting in to, and conforming to existing cultural practices. We know that we're social animals as human beings. Um, if a group of people is behaving in a certain way, it's very difficult for someone else to stay outside that and, and do different. Um, so sometimes particular working cultures or just that, that fear of uh, how decisions might look to patients, families, colleagues, professional bodies, organization, media, et cetera, all these things might come into play. And we're human. I don't think that, um, I, you know, I mean, I, I can't see a way around that. I think, I think we're human. I think we just need to acknowledge it um, and try and be open and transparent about our own fears and how our own fears are influencing our decisions as well. And the importance of transparency and good relational practice cannot be overstated. So like you might as well just throw the model in the bin unless you're going to really, really think about how we're communicating uh, these decisions uh, with, with people. Um, and I think that while people with the diagnosis of BPD are kind of known to have difficulties in interpersonal relationships. I've also experienced a lot of staff um, that have difficulties in interpersonal relationships. Um, and I'm keen, to, I'm keen to say that because I think it can become too easy to pathologize people and um, when there are instances of kind of communication breakdowns, uh, place all the blame uh, with patients. But I've certainly seen some instances where communication breakdowns were as much, if not more, about staff than, than it was the patients. So good relational practice is absolutely key. I'm going to add a little bit of context. Again, uh, plug in uh, a literature review that I had uh, published um, last year, and I'll put a link to that below as well. So positive experiences of crisis intervention for people diagnosed with BPD, and these are not incredibly kind of complex things that are quite simple things that people um, people want and need to, to feel supported. The first thing being access to care. So I don't think exclusion is ever right. You know, what I mean, I, I don't think certainly not kind of based on the diagnosis. I think there, there might well be times where people don't need to come into hospital, don't need containing measures, but exclusion on the basis of the diagnosis um, is not it's, it's not person-centered, it's not going to be useful in any way. So if someone absolutely needs it and there's something useful we can do, then they should have access to care. They want contact with professionals. Now, there, are, there have been instances of uh, people um, essentially avoiding people with a diagnosis. Um, so 
And again, you think about that malignant alienation that we, we spoke about earlier on. Um, if people go into an environment and they see that people are kind of turning away and trying not to connect with them, then that's just going to fuel that kind of feeling of distress. Uh, and thus, like sometimes health services actually create crisis in a way, you know what I mean, can actually keep this cycle of crisis recurring. Person focused care and not diagnosis focused. Um, I know there's a lot of complex um, arguments and debate around the diagnosis. Um, I'm not a fan um, and probably the main reason I'm not a fan is the particular stigma that it does carry. I think there can be a self-fulfilling prophecy in that um, there's a stereotype that arrives with the person based on their label and there's a judgment made about um, the kind of person that they're going to be before somebody's ever met them. So I, I think that the diagnosis now, it just gets in the way of seeing somebody as a human being. Um, so we want to be person-centered and not focused uh, around the, the diagnosis. We know that the diagnosis is incredibly heterogeneous. So there's a lot of different people um, with different symptoms that end up with the same diagnosis. Um, so we have to ask, particularly in crisis care, how useful is it? Um, and there's more about that in the, the review that I did. We want to focus on the underlying distress and not just the behavior. So that comes back to the point I was making about just containing. If we're just containing, that's purely focused on the, the behavior. So we're saying that we want to prevent suicide, we want to prevent self-harm, uh, want to kind of contain risk. But are we actually doing anything useful about the reasons behind that? Are we doing anything about the stuff that's contributing to that. Um, so behavior is driven by mental states, it's driven by thoughts and feelings. And if we're not addressing those thoughts and feelings, then those thoughts and feelings are not gonna get better. So we're probably gonna see cycles of behavior that don't really change because we're not targeting the bit that actually matters. Joint decision-making. Um, so collaborating as much as possible with people. I know that that can be incredibly complex when uh, there is a uh, risk to life, but I think as far as possible, um, we want to be having genuine collaboration with people. Even if you can justify moments where we might have to take responsibility away from people, I think as soon as possible, we need to try and give that back. And I think that's always gonna be much better if there are, is good relational practice. Yeah, when staff are really good at managing those relationships. Uh, and all really hope, you know, I mean, we, we want like, when people are in crisis, it's often because they feel trapped, they feel helpless, they feel hopeless. So as clinicians, as professionals, it's so important that we carry that hope for people. Um, but unfortunately, I think sometimes due to the diagnosis, there is a sense of, um, teams feeling a, a bit defeated, you know what I mean? What, what can we do? Um, I think historically it'd been described as the dustbin diagnosis. There's papers like the, the patient psychiatrist dislike. There's a lot of negativity still around the diagnosis. And while I think that if you got rid of the diagnosis, it wouldn't get rid of all the issues. Um, I, I don't think it would hurt. I think, there's a, I think we could still provide care to people without, without the diagnostic models. Just a, a bit more kind of context, and I've just got one more slide um, after this. So some factors that this come out, came out of the review as well, some factors that influence professional intervention. So it's a bit of the context around what might be happening and why uh, within the action consequences model. So people have different uh, professional education for a start. So think about, it, we've got different disciplines. We've got kind of medicine, psychiatry, um, we've got psychology, we've got kind of mental health nursing. Um, so some of these might have a different prof professional regulation and they might have slightly different um, educations. Something that I'm keen to mention uh, as well for anyone who will listen, because I think it's really important uh, and is, is very much a personal frustration, is the theory practice gap. So the gap between what happens in education and then what might happen on kind of students' clinical placements, et cetera. Um, because I think no matter what is 
taught in a kind of classroom, it might be really important stuff. When people, when students or newly qualified uh, staff go into environments, it's very difficult to do anything other than the, the culture that is kind of, that is uh, pervasive at, at that kind of point in time. And I certainly know that um, I've taught students particular things and then they've went out into environments and been kind of like, and I've been called out by name, they've said, said to students, you know, I mean, um, stop trying to do a Dan Warrender and stuff. And some staff have said that they think that I make it hard for them by teaching things in a particular way. Um, but I think what that does is that it completely, essentially destroys anything that I have taught, you know what I mean, over, over a period of years. Um, so I could teach, I, I could teach stuff that is like, it's, you, my teaching is not perfect, but you could imagine it's perfect, but all it takes is one sentence. So stop trying to do a Dan Warner or whatever like that. And like, it's essentially, it's all thrown in the bin. So we don't just have to think about professional education in terms of what's being provided in classrooms and what's being emphasized by regulatory bodies. We need to think about that bridge between um, academia and clinical practice. And for me, there's not enough bridges. Um, there's essentially academic institutions teaching in isolation away from clinical environments. And we need to bring those two things together. Um, because I know that like some staff might watch this and think I'm being too kind of harsh on them, but I'm certainly not against staff. I'm just really for patients because uh, often patients have uh, little power when they're in these uh, environments when they're in crisis. So there's some complex issues there around uh, professional education, more than you were wanting to listen to, I'm sure. Um, the available resources, I think we have to be realistic as well. You know, I mean, we're, we've got human beings that are trying to do their best, but there is the balance between the demands of the job and what we would like to do versus the amounts of resources that we've got to do that. So that's a, a very practical and, and realistic um, thing that needs to be considered. Uncertainty regarding responsibility. Now, I think that's, that's a key issue um, with staff teams and individuals having really different ideas of how much we need to intervene in terms of like we need to keep this person safe we need to protect them we need to kind of keep them in hospital versus it's all their responsibility and um, they, they just have to get on with it and I think that's where you see the very extremes of those binary approaches you know what I mean so thinking about the Goldilocks approach is in the middle of that but the extremes are either we can essentially keep you contained or in hospital forever, or we don't ever intervene in any way with you and we leave you to it. So I think people have got very different opinions around that. And obviously that's gonna have a huge impact on the care delivered. Team conflict, um, we know that obviously because of some of the difficulties with different educations, um, different ideas about responsibility, and just the high stress that is carried uh, in decision making on risk to life, uh, risk of serious harm, that people get really stressed and there can be conflicts within teams as well. The professional distress, like, you can't overlook that, you know what I mean? This is like working with people that want to hurt themselves and want to die, might not want to be in your care, might have had previous instances of trauma, difficult relationships, and therefore having difficult relationships with you, that's hard. It's really, really, really hard. Um, and while I know, again, I can be criticized as being too hard on staff, I think that we've got that ob obligation. You know, I mean, I, th I think that we have to address that distress. We have to try and support staff as best we can. But if we want to be highly skilled, professionals, if we want to accept the applause of the people, you know what I mean, that are clapping outside their doors, etc., then we need to try and manage that distress. We need to try and make sense of it. Um, we need to reflect and we need to try and be uh, as best we, best we can. Because I think we have, as professionals, we have more obligation than patients to reflect, to mentalize. So I do hold this to a higher standard in, in that respect. But I'm not 
discounting uh, the real difficult experiences that I've had myself. It's really, really tough, really, really tough. Um, and access to clinical supervision. Um, so a, a reflective space where you can really, really think about what's going on. So think about the stuff that we discussed in the action consequences model. Have we got a space where we can really talk about that? We can really talk about issues in terms of actually, like I think where I think it, issues might be getting worse the longer this person is in the hospital. I think that actually um, they're maybe feeling a bit ostracized from everyone here. I think we might try and need to uh, build the relationship again. I think there's it just just thinking about these things, but I think unfortunately the big machine, the wheels of it, keep kind of. Uh, keep turning and it keeps moving and sometimes there's not that time to to stop and think um, and I think sometimes the, the culture around clinical supervision could be much better as well I've certainly heard of instances where um, newly qualified nurses are kind of told like oh why why are you going to clinical supervision why are you bothering with that and I think that's really dangerous if we have a culture of not thinking about stuff uh, because the opposite of thinking is ritual that's the only way you can do it uh, and I think that is that's sometimes what happens. So very finally, um, so the, the kind of final ingredients to what should I, I think should happen are taking a step back and really thinking about what's happening. So it's so important that we have a space to do that, whether it's clinical supervision or, or whatever, but really taking a deep breath, a step back, and really thinking about what's happening in terms of the mental states of everyone, you know what I mean? So trying to mentalize what's going on for me, what am I feeling right now? What is that about? What's what's my patient going through? What is going on for them right now? Keeping in mind their kind of previous histories and, and how that might be uh, important in the present as well. Genuine empathy, right? And I say genuine empathy because I don't think that anyone gets out of bed in the morning and wants to be kind of deliberately mean to patients, but I do think that when people get tired and get stressed and get a bit burnt out, that we can forget the real human experiences of people in front of us. We can get a bit of kind of sort of tunnel vision with our busyness and what's going on for us. So again, it kind of relates to that, taking that step back, trying to always remember that this is a human being in front of you. Um, Imagining if it was you, imagining if it was a loved one, I think it's a very quick way to get your head back into like, what, what are we doing here and is this helpful? Transparency is so important for people that might have experienced trauma, being really, really transparent, telling people why you're doing what you're doing with empathy, telling them maybe why you don't think something's a good idea. I think we need to be honest and try and like, try and get to a meeting of minds, try and get some kind of compromise and consensus. And that can be really, really difficult. And that's why relationships are key to, to this stuff working. Real attempts to share risk with people. I think I like that. That's the, that's the bit in the middle, isn't it? You know what I mean? Between kind of you deal with all the risk yourself versus it's all our responsibility and we'll kind of tell you when you can leave hospital. A real attempt to share that, you know what I mean? Like, I've had instances where people are maybe away to leave the therapy room and we've got that kind of sense of like in five minutes you're going to go and I'm really worried about what might happen given what you've just told me and I'm wondering what you're going to do to try and keep yourself safe and I'm wondering what I need to do and just trying to have that genuine collaboration and it's so important. Recognition that risk cannot be eliminated. I think if people are in a hospital for long, long spells, unless we're doing something in terms of providing an opportunity to develop skills or doing something, then I, I don't know what we're doing. I think we, we might almost be tricking ourselves into thinking that people will get better uh, in, in those environments. Trauma-informed care, uh, so awareness of power imbalances. Remembering that safety might not feel safe for the person, so often we contain risk in the name of safety, but does safety feel safe? Does safety feel safe to them? Yeah. And thinking about some of the very difficult experiences that people might go through, um, despite kind of like genuine um, benevolent 
and pensions by, by staff being some of these things can be really difficult. Reciprocity. So if we're removing rights and people might be in hospital for a long time, then we need to provide effective input. It's one of the, um, it's in the Milan principles of the Mental Health Act that if we are going to take away uh, people's rights, then we have to balance that out with providing really meaningful, really useful input. Uh, and finally, it's uh, David Pilgrim that has the, the quote, um, a lot of acute mental health units are risk containers rather than treatment units. And that certainly stuck with me. And that's kind of almost underpins that idea of containing risk not being synonymous with treatment. So we need hospitals to be more than risk containers. And we need the availability of more appropriate services as well. You know, I mean, like I said, it's going to be easier to tolerate risk if we've actually got other services or things for, for people to go to. Um, I know that's easier said than done. Um, it probably, this is not an ivory tower. Um, it's just my wee office, my room. These are just some of my ideas. Um, I hope somebody kind of finds them useful if they help people think about stuff, then um, that's that's a win for me. Um, and finally, here is uh, a couple of references. Um, I'll make sure I put a few links at the, the bottom of the, the video as well. Like I'm saying, I, I hope this is, this is useful. I'm just kind of thinking out loud really as I kind of bash through these slides. It's an incredibly difficult area, but we have to bear in mind that sometimes even with best intentions, healthcare does harm people. And I think that's, that's what needs to happen is just more thinking uh, about this. So I hope it was useful for people um, and feel free to ping me an email if there's anything of forgotten and um, if you want to let me know uh, if it's useful at all um, and I'll keep thinking about this and uh, I'll probably do more writing about it at some point as well. Okay, take care.